being a software founder. It was very much a, a COVID idea when, you know, my business model was completely disrupted. Some of the most significant challenges, I suppose, you have faced throughout that, that process of developing that product. As someone that's experienced burnout twice in a really deep and dark way. You're building up a debt in your product and it's similar to, to financial debt. The biggest uh, secret in the room is no matter what piece of software you're using, you're probably only actually utilizing 20% of its features. Hey there, welcome to the very first episode of Pulse brought to you by Intuji. Joining us today is Steve Clayton and I'm Julian Wallace. Steve is the visionary and founder of The Sales Game, a platform revolutionizing how sales team engage, perform and smash their targets. Over 10 years of expertise in sales strategy, customer engagement and business development. Steve's very passionate about making sales a rewarding game that drives results. He's the innovator behind the Outbound game, which is integrating fun with sales performance enhancement and got a lot of insights and knowledge. So welcome to the very first podcast, Steve. Good to have you on. Yeah, great to be here, mate. I've been uh, been looking forward to this chat and uh, I like what you're up to and obviously driving forward better digital experiences and, and picking people's brains. So I'm looking forward to, to following along on future episodes and I wanted to be episode number one, I think. So it's awesome. exciting. Yeah. No, it's good. Good to have you on. So for those that don't know you, do you mind giving us a bit of a backstory as to, to who you are in the sales game and the outbound game and, and what that's all about? Yeah, for sure. I fell into being a software founder. It was very much a, a COVID idea when, you know, my business model was completely disrupted. You know, for the last 10 years, I've been a traveling sales trainer, consultant, strategist, working with various companies around the world. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. Worked with, with thousands of people, hundreds of companies. And uh, yeah, really, a lot of it has been in the, the project space and helping companies win what, what we call whale size deals. And so I've always been fascinated by strategy and I've always been curious about those that really, you know, can smash records. And that's something that I've always enjoyed. And then COVID hit. So we couldn't travel anymore and we couldn't do business. So that's when we were kind of forced against, you know, the wall. And we thought, well, what can we do? And I grew up playing games. I've always been interested in developing my own card games and board games and I love video games. And, you know, it was just something that myself and my business partner, Darcy at the time said, okay, we've got a real opportunity here. We either can just sit and wait this thing out or maybe we can have a crack at something that we would never normally have a go at and uh from that point we made our, our first piece of software facilitating the sales game which was an event that people would attend online and they could transfer chips to each other but how they played the game revealed more of their strengths weaknesses and blind spots and it was really interesting my, my business partner has a psychology background so it's just this amazing display of human behavior and uh, we ran that event with some really large US based companies and three people gave us the same feedback, which was, Hey, this is a really cool idea. I learned a lot about myself. This is very different, but it'd be awesome if you guys could make a game that we could play all day, every day at work. And then that was the, that was the big idea. And we started to move towards what's now called the outbound game, helping teams smash KPIs, crack records. And then one of the most important parts I feel is celebrating like mad. And so, yeah been a lot of fun interesting interesting very very uh very cool backstory there so i suppose regarding the outbound game that's obviously your biggest focus at the moment and, and from what i could see obviously following your, your content and, and seeing what you, you guys are doing you obviously got other things going on as well um but the outbound game you're putting a lot into it i know you've done a lot of crm integrations and things recently um as well so i would just like to understand a bit more about like where did it all start in regards to how you actually kicked off the development um around that and what's the journey been like so far to actually building out the outbound game and building that product mate it's been easily the the hardest venture i think i've ever had to undertake um okay. the classic thing in, in software development or technology development is you know it takes 10 times longer than you expected and costs a hundred times more than you expected. And I probably went into it being a little, little naive thinking, no, we can figure this out. You know, we can, we can start developing this and find a good team to help us build this. But it's certainly been a, a, a mammoth journey. I found with 
technology and software, you run into a million invisible problems that you can never really forecast or see, and you just have to kind of go through it uh, to get there. But how it all started, mate, is our accountant actually reached out to us and said, um, there's a $10,000 grant available they can use for digital transformation. You guys might want to have a crack at this. So we we're successful in the grant and in the software world that lasts all of 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was enough to just, you know, give us the nudge to actually start building. And we had, we had no idea what we were doing, but we always went into it with a very scientific approach, which was let's not build what we think people want. Let's just spend a lot of time actually speaking with the market and understanding what it is that they have in terms of problems. And as you mentioned now with, you know, really sophisticated CRM integrations and things like that, the most common challenge we always found with sales teams is they've invested in a lot of technology, a good tech stack, a good CRM, but it doesn't get used. And it's always a forever, you know, motivational battle to try and get the team to engage in this system in the platform and enter their notes and activities. And from our side doing sales training, the biggest gap we always felt as well was you could share a bunch of great ideas, but actually getting it implemented was always the biggest challenge. So yeah, four years later, we've invested over a million dollars of our own money, you know, developing this platform, but we're now at a point um, ready to scale. And I really believe that pretty much every business model has an opportunity to create niche software that supports their processes. And I'm, I'm expecting or anticipating that companies are going to start thinking creatively around how they can add technology into their business model to give themselves an unfair advantage. So yeah, yeah. that's how it all started. No, it's, it's, it's awesome. Awesome story. And it's a, it's a, I'd say a classic startup story. Um, and, uh, that definitely, gives you a lot of different opportunities at the, the software space where you, you may have an idea or something to innovate. Um, there's, there's so much opportunity there for all sorts of businesses, especially even legacy businesses sometimes fall into the trap of thinking, oh, you know, we're just a blue collar business or a legacy business. You know, there's no way we could ever do anything like that there, but it's just closing your mind off top. There's opportunities for everyone. Um, there's at the end of the day, there's, there's inefficiencies or things that could be completely revolutionized or without being cliche, but, it's just you've got to you got to want to look for them. Um, you've got to think, hey, how could we, how could we do this, and how could we flip it on its head? I, I just want to understand a bit more about um, some of some of the most significant challenges I suppose you have faced throughout that that process of developing that product. Has it been kind of misaligned requirements um, with the dev team? Has it been capturing that user feedback and 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 Put, putting that into requirements and making sure that it, that it's crystal clear has it been actually you know with the tech and the tech stack that you actually chose i'm not aware if you want to get into that as well but if you uh, have you made to make any changes in that as you've gone along and, and scaled it out i suppose what are some of the biggest things specifically that we could get into around that you've faced yeah that's a great question i i think a common challenge that i've heard from other you know, software founders or those interested in technology is really finding that gun developer or that gun team that can take your vision because often founders or people with big ideas, they, you know, they're, they're visionary by nature. So you get some sort of idea in your head of what you would like to see. But we've found a lot of people fall into the, the communication breakdown where they try and share that vision with the development team the dev team go away and spend countless hours and ridiculous amounts of money building something. And then by the time it actually gets to some sort of MVP or some sort of working prototype, you're like, ah, oh, that's not what I meant. And so I think a lot of founders get stuck in that, that realm. Um, we kicked off our development with an agency based over in Sweden, actually. And I think, you know, sometimes working with that type of model is a good way to get started, but eventually you kind of really need to find that long-term partner that is willing to stick with you yep. and really sort of invest in that. So we, we've got really lucky with our with our development team that we haven't had those communication breakdown. Like um, our, our lead developer is just an absolute gun. He's really got the vision and has worked with us for a number of years now on the project. So that wasn't so much a challenge, but I wanted to bring it up because that normally is mm -hmm. the number one challenge I've heard is communication breakdown. Yeah. In hindsight, 
we're only really getting to a point now where we're experiencing product-led growth. We're about to launch a free version of the platform that's kind of limited in functionality, but gets people started and gets people understanding how they can apply gamification to their sales goals and sprint goals. In hindsight, we probably should have started with that. <laughs> um, one of the biggest challenges I've personally had as a visionary is sometimes you over-engineer, over-build, put way, way too many features in that when you actually look at how people are using your platform or mm. using the technology, they're using like 10% of what you probably actually can do with it. Yeah. And so that's cost us a lot of money, but I suppose we're at an exciting point now where the product is really sophisticated and has all of the features that I envisioned from the beginning. Um, but now we're just focusing on scale and, and bringing people into it. So if I had my time again, I would have focused on a far scrappier, simple version Yep. and then get as many people into it as possible and then use that to really inform the dev roadmap rather than anticipating and seeing what they might want in the future, going ahead and building it and then realizing, ah, uh, actually, you know, that little 10% over here that we thought was small and insignificant was actually the thing that really mm -hmm. drove use. Um, and so for us, integrations has been absolutely key. We're really only at a point now where we've been able to really upgrade our integrations to a really sophisticated level. But if I had my time again, I would have, yeah, made a really simple scrappy version, understood that integrations is absolutely key and probably fast track that actual part of the, of the development. So yeah, that's been some of the key challenges. Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> I want to understand your perspective on what you've learned, right? What you may have thought before jumping into a SaaS product like this year or a software development project um, or a venture where what's changed in your mindset. Uh, that's what I find fascinating between people from the outside that have never actually been involved in something, even a, even the difference between something at a smaller scale to a larger scale. But what's changed? What, what did you think before around kind of software products or ventures and how it all was meant to work and, and, and and what do you think now? What's the biggest learnings for you personally there? Uh, the biggest thing I've had to learn, and it kind of flows on from that previous answer, is the concept of surrendering to simplicity. Um, as, a, as a natural salesperson, as a marketer, as a content creator, you know, we can sometimes get caught up in the world of hype and, you know, find really colorful and a brilliant ways to say how cool your little widget is or whatever it may be. But you notice that uh, what I've noticed is unless the market can clearly articulate the value of what it actually does, all of the hype and the fanciness and all of the complexity in language just goes out the window, right? Like yeah. when, you, when you think about your favorite platforms that are really kind of viral in nature, you can normally language that in a really simple way. Right. Mm. Like I, I personally love using Vidyard to create personalized videos. Right. Yeah. And so people can just simply say, oh, it's super easy. You click a button, you can record your screen and then you can send it with a thumbnail in your email. It's pretty cool. That's how people actually talk about it. Where yeah. as founders, sometimes we're like, oh, it has this really cool, sophisticated widget and it's going to empower you to do blah. But really, I found the market is far more simple. <laughs> Uh, in the way that they, they language things. So I've really had to surrender to simplicity and just find out what is the simplest message that you can actually share that speaks to the value proposition of what you do. Um, so that's been hard for me to do. I've had to unlearn a lot of things and just boil it down into its, you know, most potent, simple parts and go, hey, how would you describe our platform to your mate? Yeah. Like, what, what do you think it is? And you realize that, you know, as you get more feedback around that, we've gotten a whole lot better of actually, you know, communicating our value proposition. So surrendering yeah. to simplicity, absolutely been the number one thing I've learned. And maybe the irony of that is as you build software and technology, it is so complicated and so complex. Very much so. Um, the best technology and the best software looks so simple and easy on the front. And in the back end, it's all an absolute schmuzzle. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's I wanted to uh, to touch off on that a bit more as well, and and um, get your uh, thoughts on or your experiences around 
it's very easy to fall into the trap of uh, thinking it's just like a, a physical thing, right? And I liken this a lot in my, whether it's discovery calls with clients, whether it's in my content, anything like to, to building, right? It's something people can understand. It, it, software is something very difficult to grasp for someone that doesn't understand it. And the reason is there is nothing tangible that they can see. Apart from the product, they can see the end product. They cannot see how it was built. Um, and uh, unless you actually understand that, um, and have been in that world, it, it's it's very difficult. And the human instinct is to fear the worst, um, or you know, just to, to to jump or at your fear when when you don't understand something. And the biggest thing I see or shift is people go from, "Why is this happening? You know, this shouldn't happen. It shouldn't crash like that, or it shouldn't have a bug, or it shouldn't. You know, that wasn't meant to work like that." Or Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And it's not as simple. Again, I'll use a building analogy: as, is whacking some timber together to make a frame, right? It's not that simple. There is something can go wrong, and there could quite literally be a million variables as to why that happened. Um, and it's that's one of the most difficult things I see people struggling with when they aren't familiar with it. They aren't familiar with. Uh, with with the process and so i'd like to understand from your perspective whether that was something that you came across you know not being um when when you first kind of got into it to where you are now yeah 100 percent. that's that's super interesting mate and 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 it is well said you know like um, we do we get people come to us and go oh it'd be cool if it could have this feature and you know in their mind it's like you know just whack a column on there and you know make it make the data visualize in this just copy way. paste it yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and that's how a lot of people engage with software or technology because, you know, good software and technology does have a great user experience. And it's like, oh, I want it just there and it should look like this. Um, but as you start to learn a little bit more about, you know, all of the layers of code and what connects with what and what tables link with what, your brain does go into a bit of haywire going, yes, it would be great to just have that simple column. But to do that, it's going to require a whole lot of engineering and so what we've what we've uh had to learn to do over time is not race straight into the next piece of development we did that at the start so any you know one person would go oh it'd be cool if we could do this and then i'd immediately go all right sweet it's on the dev roadmap let's start building it what i'm now starting to learn is practicing that again scientific approach of when the sample size is big enough and if it actually makes sense, yeah, of course, it's going to happen and we'll fast track it. So it's that patience I've had to develop to go, I can take your idea, I'm going to, I'm going to document that idea, I'm going to validate that idea. And if it's shared by enough people, we'll do it. Um, yeah. But if not, we're not just going to run in a million different directions because we did that. And then all of a sudden you've got this very wide but shallow uh, piece of technology yeah. Instead of you know narrow, narrow and deep. Yeah, it's very. I've heard it, heard it heaps and heaps and heaps. It's it's known as, and you're probably aware of this, but sales led development. And essentially, what it le- leads to is that people have got a product, and they may even even at a smaller scale from a startup, a founder section, where they are doing that sales led development. Or you could have, um, you know, bigger SaaS companies or bigger enterprises where their sales teams are like, yeah, 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 we, we can do that to, in order to, to close deals, right? And naturally, they, they want to close deals. They want to get things across the line and people are asking for features. It's like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. What it essentially leads to though, as you rightly say and, and well said, was, was around a very clunky experience because it's essentially been like tacked on like things have been tacked on and they are typically delivered at a faster pace because it's required to get a deal or it's required because the client is putting pressure on um and therefore you don't have the time needed to actually do it properly Uh, i find it Mm. very interesting and it's something that we see and we've had experience with um ourselves but see it see it a lot where especially from a startup perspective it's that it's a natural process and a growth process where it's like we're trying to get and please everyone and we you know we just want to get as as many people on the product as possible which is totally natural but what actually ends up happening as you say is you end up hurting yourselves because it's like well one person ended up using this and it's like yeah could have we could have built something else in that time that everyone was using kind of thing so i find find that very interesting as well and it's it leads to um 
of something known as technical debt. And I don't know how familiar you are with that, but around the technical mm, debt yeah. side where you're building up a, a bit like financial debt, you're building up a debt in your product and it's similar to, to financial debt. It's a healthy, it, it can be a healthy thing, right? All products mm. to a degree have have technical debt. You cannot ever have a perfect product unless it's very, very small. If you've got a larger scale product, you're going to have yes. a level of technical debt. It's how you manage that. But what you don't want is that debt spiraling out of control um, to the point mm. where you cannot scale and maintain that product effectively. Um, and, mm. and that's all about management. And, and sales-led development is, is something that contributes to that massively uh, as well. So yeah. I don't know if you got any comments on that. Yeah, I've never heard of the, the term technical debt, but yeah, definitely uh, definitely resonates, you know. Um, I would have... I would have done things a lot differently if I think I had that concept in mind because you do, you do amount a lot of debt. And the other thing that a lot of people, you know, don't realize, I suppose, is you've got a certain level of maintenance costs in the same way that you have if you built 10 houses, right? Like mm. instead of just having one really solid piece of technology, one solid house, you know, if you build 10 different things, you also have to maintain and upkeep and, you know, have all of that parts running. And I think the Pareto principle just really comes to shine in, in every area of life, including technology. I, I think the, the biggest uh, secret in the room is no matter what piece of software you're using, you're probably only actually utilizing 20% of its features. Mm. Um, you know, and I think actually understanding what is that 20% that your users are actually really enjoying and getting a lot of value and tripling down on that and starting to forget about the other 80% that could be cool. But like you said, two people use it other than that, it's invisible. Yeah. I think you could, you could build a, a way sharper product in a lot less time with a lot less cost. So again, I made all of those mistakes. I'm just sort of reflecting on the last four years. If I, if I considered technical debt, I probably would have done things a little differently. Yeah, well, you're not the only one, so so I don't feel bad about it. I don't feel like you're the only one because it, 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 it's in all projects and we see it across. Um, it's just something that's got to be, be managed and something that um, that is really important uh, at the, mm -hmm. you know, that people understand when they're getting into things like this year around trying to avoid essentially making it as easy to understand as possible but that debt spiraling out of control um, and that really comes yeah. back to the architecture and, and how things are built i want to get into a bit more as to if you look back uh, we obviously covered some of the things some of your learnings and um you know experiences but if you look back what what do you reckon would be the biggest thing that would have helped you get to where you are now quicker in regards to you know un you know, whether it's something that you understood, whether it was guidance or a, or a mentor or someone that had been there, whatever it is, but what do you reckon it would be the biggest thing that would have helped you get from where you were when you founded it to where you are now, uh, let's say in half the time or, or a lot faster? Yeah, I think um, where where tech founders, myself included, can, can get themselves stuck is they become uh, a little insular and, and what I mean by that is you get so focused on the product and you get so focused on what you want to build, you sometimes lose that real, you know, close touch with the clients. Now, we've always been sales led and always wanted to get feedback, but I think I would have made that even more of a priority, um, yeah. even, even more so than just always working on the next part of the user experience or the um, the next part of the dev roadmap. So I, I think I would have prioritized that a heap more. We're doing a lot more of that now is like really doing a good job of capturing feedback. Like one thing that's made a game changer for me is like jumping on Zoom calls with our clients, getting them to share their screen yep. and be like, just run me through. Like, what do you click on a lot? What do you, where do you go? How do you use it? And actually just mm. seeing what they click on, what they don't click on, what they realize is there, what they don't realize is there has been yeah. invaluable for me. Um, I used to just do it in a conversational way of like, hey, tell me what you like about the product, what don't you like, what you wish it had. But literally just like when you're on a screen share, you know, it can be frustrating because you're like, no, 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 you just, you just click there and it's immediately there. 
Yeah. Um, but to them, they're just like, oh, I didn't even know that. So it just gives you huge insight. So I would have done a lot more of that kind of screen share interview, like run me through how you're using this day to day and where you click in and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but the other thing that I, I probably would have, would have done a whole lot um, more uh, if I had my time again is start building strategic partnerships from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Because what I found in, in tech development is you get, you get product focus, you get it to a point where it can start to scale or more users can, can be uh, added. But to do with that yourself through your own marketing, through your own content, it's pretty hard. Yeah. We found it to be way quicker and easier to do it through a partnership model. So we're working with a lot of HubSpot partners. We're working with a lot of Salesforce partners. We're working with a lot of other sales trainers and consultants and like building partners that can get the essence of our product, put together rev share arrangements and actually help them scale our product through their network. So that'd be the two things. I, I would have started building strategic partnerships from the very beginning. Uh, I had a fear that there's no point building those partnerships until the product is finished. But, you know, I'm sure they would have given us invaluable feedback mm. if we had them on board from the very beginning. Uh, and the second thing is I would have done a lot more screen share, like actually show me how you're using the product from the beginning. I reckon that would have fast tracked years off of our development. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Uh, I, I, I definitely agree with those points and understand them and it, you only learn from experience right um and it's it, it's uh something that we see i'd like to get into a bit more around um just understanding a bit more of your philosophy and the gamification of sales um and a bit more as to where that came came from when you were uh when you first came up with the idea around obviously you were a sales trainer etc but where it kind of it sparked to go Hey, if we can make this a fun, you know, fun, fun game. Obviously, that is now eventually leading to your SaaS product, but more just the concept behind it. Obviously, was was gamifying sales and and where that came from, and understand that a bit more. Yeah, for sure. No, it's um, it's been a fun journey, right? So, motivation has always been something that has been a challenge for our clients, and I get a lot of people reaching out to me and a lot of it is mindset related. They feel like they're in a funk. They feel demotivated. They feel tired. They feel bored. They feel burnt out. Uh, leaders are stressed out because they feel like they have to micromanage their team and you know give them a motivational speech one day and then hit them with the stick the next. And it was just this common through line of, of you know mindset, motivation. How do you actually stay motivated? You know, for years I'd was recording, you know, Monday motivation videos and sharing that with the my list. And now we're doing the Monday motivation meeting. So there's always this through line of motivation. And it got me thinking, where on planet Earth is there no motivation problems? And it got me thinking about the arcade. I've got mm. two young daughters. We spend a lot of time at our local arcade and we love it. You know, you spend a yeah. hundred bucks like that. They love it. I love it. You see people of all ages, all backgrounds. There's just this hunger and drive. There's no motivation issues at the arcade. It's more the opposite of like, give me another go. Give me another go. Oh, I can do that. Let's have a crack at that. It's this like insatiable hunger. And I looked at the model and I thought, why is that so? And I was like, it's pretty simple, right? You got simple games that are simple to do. If you're good at the game, you get more tokens. And when you got more tokens, you get a better crappy little basketball hoop at the rewards kiosk at the end, right? Like adults love it. Kids love it. It's this idea of like, I earned these coins by my own abilities and my own talents and skills. And then the more I get, the better prizes I can receive. And I was like, well, that's pretty straightforward. What if we made the workforces arcade? What if we turned sales into something very similar where you get tokens and coins for every little action you do you get big bonus multipliers if you hit you know the three point before the timer runs out sort of thing and what if we made our own rewards kiosk where people could just cash in the coins at the end for the prizes that 
truly lit, lit, lit them up and motivated them. And it was a combination of that as a model and then talking with heaps and heaps of leaders and salespeople, um, asking them how well they celebrate when they hit big goals. And I found that most people absolutely suck at celebration. They work super hard. They might hit a record month in the business. And then they have this like next syndrome, which is like, just do it all again, do it again and again and again. It might resonate with you. Like a lot of people feel yeah, this way. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And I'm like, well, of course you're eventually going to get burnt out, bored, both. If you're just working super hard, you might even hit goals but then you just move straight on to do it all again. Like no one's going to enjoy that. Like no one. And so I found the big gap was a lot of leaders weren't engaged with their team on a personal level. When we asked them like, Oh, how do you reward your team? Oh, we pay them big commissions. Great. What do, what do your team spend your commissions on? No leader could ever tell me. It's like, I don't know what they spend their money on. I'm like, okay, well, this is a personal disconnect because they're not just working to make money. They're, they're, they're working to make money to f fuel some sort of life that they want to lead. That conversation got awkward for leaders because they're like, well, how do we introduce that? And so the personalized reward store going, hey, Julian, if you smash all your goals and I could give you, you know, $250 worth of coins to spend on whatever you wanted, guilt-free, <laughs> find yeah. the things that you would love but you can't justify, what would you love? All of a sudden we realize, you know, Johnny's into fishing and Jenny loves painting and, you know, old Bud's always working on his project car in the shed every weekend or such and such is a big foodie and they just love spending money on really nice food. And it started to bridge this gap of like personal fulfillment and work. And, you know, you might remember from the old, sales adage you know every no is actually paying you money because it's yeah. leading to another yes like i'm like well, why don't we just literally physically show that that you are getting a little bit of coins every time you make a call and you get more coins if you book a meeting and you get even more coins if you do something creative like sending a video personalized video or a lumpy mail and we just customize the game to suit the business goals the activities that they want to see more of and then we fill a reward store of personalized prizes and rewards at the budget of the company's choosing and the game takes care of of the rest so that was the philosophy behind it it seemed to have worked we saw teams that you know we were telling them to send personalized videos in their sales sequences for months and no one ever had the courage to do it all of a sudden we set up a 24-hour blitz where we put some prizes and coins on offer and one team they sent 126 personalized videos in a day where the previous 10 years they had sent none. And the leader's like, what the heck? Like, how did that happen? It's like, yeah. we just created the right environment. We fueled it with the right rewards. And all of a sudden people overcome their fear and they start taking massive action. So yeah, that's the that's the gist of it all. Very interesting. You could certainly see the concept and I, I, I certainly certainly see um, it working, you know, and how it works, right? Because it's somewhat, taking i suppose the emotion out of it to a degree I, I suppose if that's the right way to look at it but essentially it's just like i'm playing a game here right it's not i'm not it's removing the pressure i suppose is more the way what i'm getting is this, i'm playing a game i'm just you know just need to hit these numbers and i you know if i do this i get rewarded and and essentially a a, a byproduct of that is success for the company basically um because at the end of the day if you do it obviously needs to be the right activity, but if it's frameworked and set up properly where they're doing the right activity, if you do it uh, enough of that, you're going to get results, right? Yeah, 100%. And the big upside we saw with that as well, like talking about the, the classic, you know, debate of uh, quality versus quantity, like the answer is both. If you can increase quality and quantity, you know, sales is somewhat based on physics right like if you increase your outbound activity you get more focused you get more enthusiastic in those activities normally good stuff happens you know it's it's pretty kind of scientific in that way so that's where the integrations came in where by integrating it with C key activities in the crm and making sure quality call notes and all that stuff was you know part of the mandatory field otherwise they couldn't get their coins all of a sudden, we also saw system use go through the roof. And then as the team becomes more systemized, it becomes more scalable, it becomes more consistent. 
Um, but the other things we've even gamified is just behaviors. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, we've run marketing games, we've run health and culture games. A company ran a recruitment game where they were struggling to find key talent. So they put up a game for the entire company to say, hey, if you refer a mate in for a job interview, you get X coins. If they're a successful hire, you get huge coins. And then all of a sudden, every employee in the organization was a recruiter and worked mm -hmm. a, worked the treat. We've seen, you know, health and culture games where teams are being rewarded for exercise and collaborating with a teammate on a deal and, you know, doing one on one meetings with with their teammates. So we really had a vision of building a gamification engine that wasn't just limited to sales. It's just so happens with our background. Go figure a lot of sales teams are using it. But yeah, it's super exciting for me to see when people fully understand the power of gamification and how it can change behaviors, how they start to go, oh, well, we could we could design a game for that. We could design a game for this. And the creativity that comes out of that just lights me up. Yeah, definitely. I, I Something I haven't had a massive amount of experience with and I, I find fascinating and that's where it kind of leads me into my, my next question around I, I would like to, to, to pick your brains, get your, no, or your knowledge and insights on or how do you think businesses could bring this in a B2B environment to their customers right now with, it, with a caveat being without being cliche uh, and without being gimmicky, right? And it's like, Hey, we're trying to gamify this, so you spend more money, right? How do you, how do you overcome that, and, and what are some ways that potentially, with you know, portals or other digital platforms or products, etc., where businesses could actually deliver a, a genuinely better customer experience by introducing some level of gamification into their process? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we are we are having you know chats with various businesses now, exploring you know how they can leverage gamification for their own their own world their own business their own their own clients so to speak rather than just the activities within their business and the big conversation we're spending a lot of time chatting about is smart fun sophisticated referral programs i think mm -hmm. in a world where we're bombarded with ai spammy messaging and a thousand linkedin requests saying <clears throat> i can help you with everything excuse me we're going back i believe to that more partnership led approach to business. The old school virality that comes through strong word of mouth. And so what we're having conversations with, with a lot of clients at the moment is how do you build a really fun, scalable referral program that rewards our clients for sharing more about the business and bringing other people into the business or adding value to the business. And so I think that's a huge opportunity for nearly every business is to take a good look at your referral program. One, do you even have one? But two, could you look at even gamifying the way that you can get your market to, to share more of what you're doing? So yeah. that's, that's definitely an area I think a lot of businesses should be thinking about at the moment. Very interesting. It is. So that's how Dropbox's growth exploded was was whole way through basically referral marketing and, and you know when you used to sign up to Dropbox, <laughs> you'd get a link and and that's that was their growth strategy. That's what they they essentially gamified that through their referral. You get rewarded for referring more people, and it's it's certainly commonplace or has been for a while in SaaS, but it's it, in a B two B environment. I've if ever rarely seen it done, if that makes sense. It's something a very interesting concept. I, I agree. It's yeah. something that, that they could look at and I, I found it definitely very interesting. I don't know if you got any more about it. Yeah, well, the other thing that's been tying onto that is it's, you know, I think it's a combination of testimonials, case studies and referral programs tied into some sort of, you know, promotion game, so to speak. So where I've seen businesses do this really well, and I'm glad you brought this up. You know, it's it's been massive in SaaS forever because you can just get an affiliate link and, yeah. you know, you code it so it comes up and you're done. But where I think businesses are getting huge leverage in this is is some of those legacy businesses, the, the blue collar businesses, the manufacturers, the projects based construction teams or whatever it may be. Because often marketers have a real hard time on capturing testimonials and case studies from their clients. Yeah. Um, but normally your best referrers start as testimonies and case studies and those testimonies and case studies turn into referrals. So we've seen some teams do it really well where you get rewarded for, you know, 
leaving a Google review or writing a written testimonial in the type form. You get even more if you record a video with that. And then on top of that, you get mega rewards by referring successful people into your business. And so I think, you know, combining that, how do we get more people promoting what we're doing through testimonials and case studies? If you increase that, you'll naturally increase referrals. But then if you've got a solid referral program on the back of that, I think you can build a lot of virality pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what One of the things we've explored before and uh, as well is that on the back of that testimonial case study, but more around user-generated content, um, which is uh, more, I wouldn't say more authentic, but, um, you know, is more natural uh, as to, to where it's essentially uh, – similar to what you've done in, in the outbound game with, with individuals where it's internal, right? They're sharing certain posts or, you know, they're doing activity on behalf of the company, et cetera. But same thing from a client perspective, but it is hard. It's much more hard uh, than, than an internal thing to crack because it's not, it, not everyone's on the same page. Not everyone's using the same systems and, and you want to be able to track it. And at the end of the day, you don't want it to become a manual process, right? Where it becomes more of a headache than it's, than it's actually generating. Um, so yeah, certainly think there's, if, if people look outside the box and, and look at processes and things in their own business individually and go, okay, is there possibilities of, of gamifying this or even just making it more of a, an interactive experience is the way I'd describe it, where it's not just generic, um, you know, submit a contact form or something like that there, but it's more, much more of a, not gimmicky, but more of an interactive experience. And I, I think that's that's where people should be looking. I want to get your thoughts on, I know you, you discussed it a little bit earlier, but kind of AI, um, this is more getting off the products and SaaS and et cetera, more just on focusing on the sales side, but get your comments on it. It's something that's obviously big in our world around around AI and from actually creating you know models and working with models to, to just being big in, in our space in general. But what you see the... Uh, the future of AI within sales and we're obviously seeing massive updates to, to models like ChatGPT and, and automation around the APIs becoming even faster where we can, you know, on a spin uh, generate kind of mass outbound emails. We've seen products like Copy AI that have just totally built around this outbound stuff and even things where we've got products like HeyGen which are instant avatars and uh, generating talking head videos and, and personalized mm -hmm. videos supposedly at scale. Now, just to clarify my opinion on this in context for you is I think they're nowhere near the level of um, feeling authentic and also uh, yeah. even looking at and it's, but I do see it getting there at some point, but it's, it's an interesting one. One I find fascinating at the moment to see. I know for a fact we've had it. We've just our industry is number one known for terrible outbound uh, and <laughs> known for spamming people and companies nonstop, and that's only dramatically increased since AI. Um, I just lost power, but that's all right. <laughs> what a what what a time to have a power outage. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, shut it down. Right. AI, AI heard you were talking about it, and I know uh, they just uh, it just decided that it didn't want me to say any more. Um, yeah, so yeah. where were we? Where were we? We were discussing we we're discussing AI. Basically, what, what I was getting to is around uh, around it's at the moment it's it's nowhere near where it needs to be. I do see it in the long term getting to that, but how do you stand out? How do you still make a difference and stand out obviously ai just feels different it doesn't feel the same right it's not you no. can just tell you, you you can you know when it's not so i'm just interested to get your thoughts on it yeah it's great man i love having this conversation because i i think it's a it's got a philosophical angle to it as well um i think all humans have this natural desire to be connected to other humans and when we sense like that is disconnected through technology um, there's a part of us that doesn't want it. And so my perspective on AI, I think it's the most incredible advancement we've ever seen. 
it's ridiculously powerful and it's only getting stronger and faster and more capable literally every millisecond that we pour into this thing. So I think to one, avoid the conversation or learning about how to utilize AI. If you avoid that, I think it's, it would be equivalent to saying back in the days when the internet came out going, oh no, we don't need this. You know, the, the, the world will never live in an internet based fashion. You know, it'll always still be face to face and handshakes. Right. It's, I think it's unwise to avoid learning about AI now. I think early adopters of understanding how AI can be used will absolutely have an unfair advantage in the future. Where I see AI actually ending up is just being an insanely powerful worker. I don't think AI should ever actually be used for communication or communicating the human element of what we do. Like when we get to a point when AI is so powerful at generating videos that it's indecipherable to know whether it's real or not, people's distrust is going to go through the roof because they're going to go, well, that, is that a deep fake? Is that real? Is that like, who is it? So where mm. I think the opportunity actually lies in AI specifically for sales and outbound is all of those repetitive worker based tasks that you could just get an automated robot to do for you. Things like insane levels of research and being able to, fully understand your ICP and then use that intelligence to actually have a human conversation. It's things like summarizing conversations and doing transcripts and subtitling videos and all of that type of worker based task that really anyone can do, but takes a lot of time. I, I see AI dominating in all of that space. What I don't want to see is AI replacing human to human communication. And this is why I think we hate the spammy AI sales emails, because you can just tell that there's no human element in that. It's mm. literally just some sort of robot that's spat out that same sort of AI based jargon. So yeah, I think anyone that's using AI for communication will find that it eventually fails on them. I think anyone using AI for worker based tasks, behind the scenes research, behind the scenes stuff that takes time that it can do a way better job than you in that space. And then using that intelligence to be creative and stand out and, you know, the, you get the AI to do ridiculous amounts of research on a prospect and it, you, you find out, you know, something really peculiar and obscure that, you know, if you brought that up in conversation, they're like, whoa, you've done your research, man. That's interesting but you're the human delivering that message. I think that's where all the leverage will be found. Yeah. Interesting. So on that topic, have you got, is there anything on, on the roadmap for, for bringing AI into, into the outbound game or is that just exploring yeah. that at the moment, just having a look at it? Yeah, we have, I've already done a few things. I, I've built my own uh, GPT that I'm just playing around with in the background, um, particularly yeah. around um, game planning, um, and analysis on breaking down big goals into really actionable steps. So I've yep. got it to a point now where we can just take a screenshot of the planner screen, which lists out all of the goals over what time period, at what quantities, and at what budget. And then it analyzes all of that and writes you a detailed step-by-step -step action plan broken down into days and weeks to execute to help you win the game. Um, nice. So... Yeah, we're, we've definitely got AI on our roadmap for that in terms of really at the end of the day, gamification is just about smart goal setting. And so yeah. if we can use AI to go, tell me all your big goals, what are the activities and the metrics and the numbers and how are you going to reward yourself on that? And then you let it generate the com you know complete detailed action plan step by step of exactly what you need to do. I think that's a winner. Yeah, aw awesome. Um, I had one more point noted down. I just wanted to discuss about the outbound game and, and how you're pricing that at the moment and understanding your strategy around that. Are you pricing that per user? Is it you know per amount of activities or how are you doing that at the moment? Yeah, we're we're currently pricing it based off yeah per user per month, um, and then we do onboarding packages depending on the level of you know integration that they want set up and. We're currently, you know, very um, hybrid in our business model where yep. I, I didn't want to jump into the full SaaS-led, zero human touch, 
click a button and get started on your own. Like, of course, long term, we'd love to be more and more, you know, product led growth or experiencing product led growth. But at the moment, we really want to give clients great experience. So we really support them in the onboarding, the setup and the team kickoff calls to, to help them really drive that forward. So we're making some revenue based on the onboarding and the setup. And yep. then we have ongoing subscriptions ballpark, depending on the number of people, it's around $29 per player per month um, over a 12 month agreement. Um, but then where we're also getting some, some good wins is we can align the game with particular training packages, playbook creations, you know, coaching and mentoring. And so that's currently our business model is yeah, a bit of onboarding integration setup support. We've got our subscription model, which kind of helps you know, pay the bills every month. Yep. And then we're doing sort of bespoke training programs based on what they need and the gaps that they need um, solved for uh, in, in the game. But long-term as well, we see an opportunity in the platform. So with the reward store, it's currently user f- fulfilled. Um, so we just use it to structure the rewards and give them how many coins they need to claim it and all of the email notifications. Uh, but we've seen about $1.2 million of rewards be paid out so far. Um, so long-term, we're looking at integrations with uh, reward store yep. providers. And then, you know, potentially we could flip the entire model where it's free to use and we just earn an affiliate on all of the rewards that are um, that are fulfilled. So we've got a few ideas and still playing around with it. I think it's a big part of software is trying to get your pricing 100%. model right and understanding where is the value proposition and, and, and sort of, you know, so we've been, you know, changing things quite regularly, but this onboarding package subscription model and then bespoke training seems to be working quite well for where we're at now. Yeah, definitely. The, the reason I ask is I know you mentioned, well, you've mentioned product led growth quite a few times and trying to move to move to, to that approach. Um, one of the things with, with product led growth, it's not the only thing or the only way to do it, but is usage based pricing as well, which is essentially, you know, for you, for you guys, it would be how, how many, how much activity or how many coins someone earns or, or whatever it is. It's essentially, that's what the business gets charged, charged on. And that's the benefit for that would be from your perspective, from a proposition would be you only pay for what the activity. So there's a direct correlation between, okay, you, if you, your team uses it heaps, you pay more, but you get more results. If they don't use it all, you pay nothing. Mm. Um, and so it's it's a very interesting strategy around basically it's you you pay for what you use. So you use little, you don't you don't pay very much. You use a lot, you pay more. But at the end of the day, you can't complain about it because you're getting <laughs> like you're getting results out of it, right? Like as in uh, that that's the point. And and it is um, it is a definitely an interesting strategy, but it, it's one that. Is, is quite a bit more complex um reason being especially when you start getting to enterprise level is you've got cfos that go well, we don't know what we're going to be charged yeah um and things like that there and that's where you know when you're talking much larger enterprise deals with with bigger product-led growth companies is that's where the challenge is but at the end of the day you can still make predictions to say well based on these scenarios this is the most average scenario. This is what you're going to be looking at paying. But as we all know, people like fixed costs and they like to know, to, you know, to be able to plan. So it's an interesting one. And uh, yeah, one that uh, we do see. And it's just interesting to throw around those different strategies. And you're very, very much right that it is a very difficult part of, of a SaaS. So if you're building an internal tool, there's obviously, it doesn't matter, right? You're not selling it. But if you're building something that's going to, you know, a SaaS product, then it is a very, very, um, crucial part of that. Uh, appreciate the conversation we've we've had, um, and I wanted to. Uh, we've we've got a f- finale segment that we do, and a couple of questions um, that I, I wanted to uh, to ask you and uh, get get your comments on. So the first one is: What's one thing you believe businesses are not paying enough attention to right now that will be critical in the next five years? Oh, that's a doozy of a question. <laughs> I think it's a bit of an unorthodox answer here, but I think in the change of demographics, you know, we've, we've hit this tipping point now where over half of the global workforce is made up by millennials. According to Salesforce, only less than 28% of reps believe they're going to hit quota. 
and over 70% are currently feeling disengaged in their work. I think this is a major problem that leaders aren't thinking about anywhere near enough, which is what does the future of work actually look like? What culture do we want to build and how do we attract and retain the next generation of talent? I think we're going to see a major shift in this. And I believe until we bridge the gap between personal and professional, because this is what the ne next generation is coming into. They want, they don't just want, you know, money. They're interested in the hybrid working life. They're interested in personal growth and fulfillment. They're interested in mentorship. They're interested in running a side hustle while they're also running business. <laughs> You know, they're, they're interested in how does this work fulfill me in a personal way and help me grow. Yeah. And I think nowhere near enough leaders are currently getting down to that real sort of like deep understanding of the humans that they work for and what is the next generation of human that's coming through. I think the businesses that will dominate are the ones that really understand that and really provide opportunities for people to grow personally in what they're doing. I think the businesses that just have an old school mentality of here's your KPIs, hit them or else, here's your quota, we'll pay you good commission, but I don't even know what you're going to spend it on. But anyway, keep coming back in next week. I think they're going to find it so hard to attract and retain talent. And so, yeah, yeah interesting. I think, as you say, something that comes down to it, a relationship, right? As in like a, a personal relationship where at the end of the day, um, there's no point trying to make out like it's a, family right as in but at the end of the day you still you're there it's where you spend most of your life you, you want a good culture you want relationships right and you want people to to uh to be to be looked after um and to feel <clears throat> one of the biggest things is to feel that if people feel like they're stagnant and they're not getting ahead at least from from my experience that's when problems start to come like you soon you know demotivation all of that starts to creep in um, and then, you know, you've got bigger issues than, um, than essentially obviously maintaining a relationship, maintaining a, a close, um, a close relationship with, with, with the team. It, it gives you a much more of a, I suppose, a, a better view as a leader um, than you would have otherwise had. Cause I've noticed like even, you know, it's been a, a, a benefit of, of our platform, the outbound game, that we didn't anticipate, but we're noticing it come up more and more and more. Um, the older generation sometimes look at our platform and go, what? So we're paying them incentives and bonuses for just doing their job. And, you know, some part you would agree with that. You're like, yeah, we do pay them for doing their job well. The problem is, is they're not currently doing their job. <laughs> so they yeah. view it as almost like this, or why should we even have to? But when the next generation's coming through and I'm, I'm seeing smart leaders bring up the outbound game in the hiring process and go on, oh, we gamify all of our KPIs. You get rewarded for everything you do. You get bonus multipliers for doing even better. The next generation coming through goes, oh, that sounds awesome. That sounds yeah. sick. Like that sound, that's something I can get around. Um, whereas they go to the next business and they're like, here's your KPIs. You got to do your job or else. They're like, I don't want to work for you. That, that's, that's not where I want to be. So that's the kind of differences I'm noticing yeah, very in generation. Yeah, very, very interesting. The next next question is, what legacy do you want to leave in your industry? How do you hope your work will influence or shape the future? That's awesome, man. Um, as someone that's experienced burnout twice in a really deep and dark way, as someone that's struggled with mental health and, you know, being vulnerable in a place of suicidal ideation and addiction and mess, I see so much pain and suffering happening in the business world of burnout, of boredom, of people just losing all purpose in their life. So my biggest legacy I want to leave in this industry is that we can create a space where people do celebrate and people are recognized for what they bring and they can find personal fulfillment in hitting records and achieving big things. And yeah. so that's really what I'd love to see. I, I love hearing the stories of how people have used their, 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 their coins for achieving things and experiencing things and taking their family places that they never dreamed possible. Yeah. And to me, that's a, that's a huge 
legacy to leave is if we can create an environment where that becomes the new normal, not burnout, not hustle culture, not boredom, not people losing all purpose and identity. I think that's going to, that's going to leave the world better than I found it. Hopefully. Yeah. I, I think it's inspiring. Um, it's definitely something that's not talked about enough. And I, I think uh, if it's a, it's much easier to, to envisage a, an, a motivated passionate team achieving results and a demotivated down and out team and and if we're not setting up frameworks and environments that facilitate that passionate bustling team it doesn't mean that it's a hustle culture or something but people want to be there right people yeah. it's it's fun right it's it's a gamification at the end of the day but it's it's fun it's a it's a good environment to be around so i i couldn't agree more the final one is if you could go back in time what advice would you give to your younger self at the start of your career that's a great one um kind of similar to how we opened the podcast man it would be it would be it'd be keep it simple um uh a lot of the pain that i've uh, inflicted on myself is by trying to do too many things at once spreading myself thin over a thousand ideas uh, getting stuck in the next shiny thing starting and stopping things consistently and it's fun. I think there's a period of time where you should try a million things and fail at a million things and just, you know, oh, that's interesting. I'll go pursue that. But there's a time where that just doesn't work anymore. And I think if I went back to my, to my younger self, it would have been more of the advice of, yeah, follow your passions. Like definitely follow the things that excite you. But keep it really simple and just really devote yourself in a single minded way to that thing for long enough. Um, and you'll be so much better off because of it. So awesome. yeah, be, keep it simple. Good, good. Well, that some, some very, uh, very awesome questions and, and answers there. So, so I appreciate, appreciate that. I appreciate you joining us for, for the first podcast as well. Um, it's been, been an awesome discussion, some very, very insightful, um, things from, from your side as to, the, the growth of the, the business and the growth of the product. So I wish you all the best with that. For anyone listening and wants access to more resources, they can head over to our learning center at intuji.com uh, and get access there. And once again, thanks, Steve. Appreciate appreciate you coming on for the first uh, first episode. No doubt we'll, we'll have you on again in the future. Mate, I really appreciate it. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed the chat, mate. And yeah, congrats on the podcast. I'll be uh, following along and looking forward to listening to future episodes. So thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you.